On February 6, 2024, Gary Gensler, the chair of the Securities Exchange Commission, responded to Congressman Ralph Norman of South Carolina and the over 70 congresspersons that attached their names to a letter requesting answers related to MMTLP. This response was due by the end of January, so as you observe how none of the questions were answered, it makes you wonder why Gensler didn't respect these 70-plus members of Congress to respond in a timely manner. I won't bore you by reading the letter in its entirety, but I will focus in on one portion. This is from the third paragraph, the SEC's Division of Examinations through its FINRA and Securities Industry Oversight, FSIO program, conducts examinations of FINRA to assess its compliance with applicable laws and regulations, as well as to promote fairness, efficiency and effectiveness in its operations. While I cannot comment on any particular examination, our FSIO programme has the role to assess whether FINRA followed its own rules and policies, the adequacy of those rules, and whether they are implemented fairly and without influence from conflicts of interest. Before we dive into why I chose this portion of the response, here's a brief primer on the events related to FINRA's U3 halt of MMTLP. On December 9, 2022, FINRA U3 halted OTC ticker symbol MMTLP, due to what they claim was an extraordinary event related to settlement and clearance. Basically, FINRA claimed that before the December 9th trading day, they determined that investors buying MMTLP wouldn't be aware that the shares would soon be cancelled, and that since their ownership wouldn't be established by the December 12th record date, these investors would be throwing their money away. On December 6, 2022, FINRA posted the first MMTLP corporate action to their daily list. It was a move that soon had the DTC seeking a meeting with FINRA and the other relevant parties. However, FINRA was a no-show. Instead, they chose to revise the corporate action on December 8th, without any input from either the issuer or the DTC. So what was the issue with the first MMTLP corporate action? There were inaccuracies, a lack of clarity, and very little time given to investors, brokerages and the DTC to make sense of the situation. At this point, we can look back to the letter, where Gensler says the following, Our FSIO programme has the role to assess whether FINRA followed its own rules and policies, the adequacy of those rules, and whether they are implemented fairly. My goal here is to aid the FSIO by pointing out a few of FINRA's rules that FINRA appears to be breaking. I'll now continue by pointing out the specific problems with the MMTLP corporate actions. FINRA's first MMTLP corporate action included a December 13th share cancellation date instead of the December 14th date that was in all of the prior disclosures from Metamaterials. To add to the confusion, the effective date on the corporate action matched this incorrect cancellation date rather than matching the December 14th pay slash distribution date. You see, the MMTLP corporate action was an exchange. Exchange being the active word, the effective date of the corporate action should have matched the date and time that the MMTLP shares were to be exchanged for shares of Nextbridge Hydrocarbons. While I understand that the MMTLP corporate action was unique, the commonality I've noticed in examples of exchange corporate actions, both before and after MMTLP, is that the term exchange or exchanged referring to one security being exchanged for another, is mentioned at least one time. In these examples, the exchange date and the effective date are predominantly the same. Neither the words exchange or exchanged appeared in either of the MMTLP corporate actions. The true reason FINRA U3 halted MMTLP, in my opinion, is that they either failed to properly review the submission made by Metamaterials or someone at FINRA intentionally sabotaged the process. The SAEC and the FSIO should be fully aware of FINRA's Rule 6490 because it codifies SEA Rule 10B17. With even a limited understanding, it should be difficult to make sense of how a corporate action could be reviewed in accordance with the rule, but somehow reach FINRA's daily list with very obvious mistakes. The purpose of the rule is as follows. In furtherance of FINRA's obligations to foster cooperation and coordination of the clearing, settling, and processing of transactions in equity and debt securities of any issuer with a class of publicly traded non-exchange listed securities in the OTC market and, in general, to protect investors and the public interest, 
FINRA's Operations Department reviews and processes documents related to announcements for SEA Rule 10b17 actions and other company-related actions to facilitate the orderly trading and settlement of OTC securities. The rule goes on to explain a list of things that FINRA is supposed to check each corporate action submission for to ensure that investors are protected and that the integrity of the market is maintained. Even though it isn't FINRA's obligation to approve or disapprove of the actions being undertaken by an issuer, FINRA is obligated to cooperate and coordinate with the issuer to ensure the proper clearing and settlement of each action. If the submission from the issuer doesn't meet FINRA's criteria, the issuer will either be required to edit their submission or the submission will be deemed deficient and a notice of deficiency like this will be sent to the issuer. In addition, SEA Rule 10 B17 gives a list of information that must be included in the notice, including, but not limited to, the title of the security, date of declaration record date, payment or distribution date, for cash distributions, the amount to be paid per share, for distribution of securities, generally the amount of the security outstanding immediately prior to and immediately following the dividend or distribution and the rate of the dividend or distribution, details of any conditions that must be satisfied to enable the payment or distribution, and additional details relating to stock or reverse splits. Issuers should review the text of SEA Rule 10 B17 to fully understand their obligations, which may be amended from time to time. According to SEA Rule 10 B17, the revised MMTLP corporate action didn't clearly define the record date nor the pay slash distribution date to say the least. This is why it was especially confusing to see how many changes were made when FINRA revised their MMTLP corporate action. If they reviewed the revision according to FINRA Rule 6490 and SEA Rule 10 B17, why would they leave out information necessary for investors to make informed decisions? Also, the December 8th revision came in the middle of the trading day, if FINRA is insisting that December 8th should have been the last trading day. Revising the corporate action on December 8th and then immediately halting trading didn't protect the investors that should have been protected by getting the MMTLP corporate action right the first time. FINRA's claim that the U3 halt protected investors that might have purchased MMTLP after December 8th is unsubstantiated. Both MMTLP corporate actions included a line informing the reader that purchases of MMTLP after December 8th would not be entitled to the distribution. Major brokerages like TD Ameritrade understood this and had plans in place to route any attempted new buys for cancellation. TD Ameritrade informed their clients that there would only be position close only trading taking place on December 9th and December 12th. But we've gotten way ahead of ourselves. Among the list of things that FINRA is supposed to check for before a corporate action can reach their daily list, number five is, there is significant uncertainty in the settlement and clearance process for the security. Wait, what? The same reason FINRA used to U3 halt MMTLP is among the things that FINRA is supposed to check before a corporate action reaches their daily list? Maybe the issuer withheld information from FINRA. Let's go to FINRA's March 16th, 2023 FAQ to see exactly how FINRA created the MMTLP corporate action. According to FINRA, the MMTLP corporate actions that posted to the daily list on December 6th and December 8th, 2022, were consistent the keyword consistent with the November 23rd announcement from Meta Materials and the information submitted to FINRA in accordance with federal law. Just to be certain, we'll begin with the November 18th, 2022 Nextbridge Hydrocarbons Prospectus. You'll notice that on the prospectus December 12th, at the close of business is the record date, the effective date of the spin-off, this is in reference to the distribution, is listed as the close of business on December 14th, and the MMTLP shares were to be cancelled immediately after. December 13th doesn't appear at all in the prospectus. On November 23rd, 2022, Meta Materials released a PR, referred to as Announcement, in FINRA's March 16th FAQ. In this PR, Meta Materials clearly stated that the record date was December 12th, the distribution date was December 14th, and that the shares of the Series A preferred stock, which is in reference to MMTLP, will be automatically cancelled at the time of the distribution. Again, there was no mention of December 13th in this Meta Materials announcement. 
while we don't have access to what Metamaterial submitted to FINRA, we have something just as good. In a social media post from November 30th, 2022, then Metamaterial CEO George Palikaras shared that he met with FINRA on that day and made it clear that Metamaterials requested FINRA to halt MMTLP on December 14th at the close, the distribution date, or to freeze trading on December 12th at close, the record date. This post didn't mention December 13th either. Here's a recap. In the November 18th prospectus, the record date was December 12th, the effective slash distribution date, and the share cancellation date was December 14th. In the November 23rd announcement from Metamaterials, the record date was December 12th. The distribution and the share cancellation date was December 14th. In the November 30th social media post from George Palikaras, the record date was December 12th and the distribution date was December 14th. In neither of these sources will you find mention of December 13th or symbol deletion. Going back to FINRA's March 16th FAQ for MMTLP, this official source of information that has been referenced and quoted in multiple court filings. This official document that has been sent to the SEC, to hundreds of members of Congress, to FINRA's member firms, and released to the millions of investors that FINRA claims to protect, this FAQ says the following. Consistent with the information provided by Metamaterials, this is in reference to the November 23rd Metamaterials PR and the information provided by the issuer to FINRA on December 6th and 8th, 2022, FINRA provided public notice of the corporate action on FINRA's website. This is the MMTLP corporate action that FINRA posted to their website on December 6, 2022. If you observe the final sentence, you'll notice that the share cancellation date is December 13th. This is inconsistent with the November 23rd announcement, PR from Meta Materials, and all of the other sources mentioned. Is the irony lost on the fact that somehow FINRA removed a day from the timeline and then eventually ended up U3 halting due to uncertainty related to settlement and clearance? It's actually mind-boggling that FINRA thought they'd get away with this. Based on the publicly available information, Metamaterials gave FINRA two dates, December 12th and December 14th. Where did December 13th come from? Some people might be confused by this December 7th PR from Metamaterials, but only if they don't understand what they're reading. This PR was released a day after FINRA posted the first MMTLP corporate action to their daily list. The PR included the wording of the corporate action, including the incorrect December 13th share cancellation date that FINRA introduced on December 6th, but below that is a disclaimer from Metamaterials that points out the fact that the dates in the corporate action came from FINRA and that they superseded all of the prior dates from Metamaterials. Below that, Metamaterials makes the suggestion that investors contact their brokers for any questions concerning the ownership of trading of the Series A preferred shares. Investors did just as instructed, and this is why there are multiple messages from a variety of brokers explaining how the trading in MMTLP would be handled after December 8th. You'll also notice that the effective date on the corporate action is the zero hour of December 13th. The purpose of the corporate action was to exchange the shares of MMTLP for Nextbridge Hydrocarbon shares one for one. This exchange was supposed to take place at the close of the December 14th trading day. How did FINRA manage to put the correct pay slash distribution date on the first corporate action, but then tie the effective date to the incorrect December 13th share cancellation date? Here's a clue. It starts with F and ends with ROD. We all know the first corporate action had a problem. Otherwise, why did FINRA revise it on December 8th? Why would the DTC request a meeting seeking clarification? FINRA never showed up to that meeting. They had no excuse either. It was supposed to be a phone call. When FINRA revised the corporate action, they didn't get input from Metamaterials and there's no evidence supporting that Metamaterials agreed to the changes. Can anyone within FSIO explain what really happened? I think FINRA gives multiple clues. Aside from referring to the corporate action multiple times as FINRA's corporate action, in the March 16th FAQ, FINRA gives another clue as to their rationale for making the revised MMTLP corporate action the way they did. When you read the second paragraph of number five, FINRA explains why they included symbol deletion. It reads as follows. On December 8th, 
FINRA amended its original December 6th corporate action announcement to clarify, among other things, that it would be deleting the MMTLP symbol on December 13th rather than cancelling the shares, because the issuer itself was responsible for cancelling the Series A preferred shares. In FINRA's own words, they informed the reader that on December 8th, FINRA amended FINRA's original December 6th corporate action. FINRA says they did so to clarify, among other things, that they would be deleting the MMTLP symbol on December 13th rather than cancelling the shares. Because the issuer itself was responsible for cancelling the preferred shares. Simplified further, what FINRA appears to say is they didn't use an incorrect December 13th share cancellation date on the Metamaterials corporate action. What FINRA is saying is they accidentally included share cancellation on FINRA's corporate action. The only purpose of FINRA's corporate action was to delete the MMTLP symbol. As preposterous as it sounds, it actually makes perfect sense when you look at the changes that FINRA made. According to the November 23rd Metamaterials announcement, the corporate action should have at the very least included a record date, a distribution date, and a share cancellation date. FINRA's December 8th MMTLP corporate action doesn't include any of the above. When you read it, it actually doesn't describe any action on the part of Meta Materials. MMTLP shareholders with settled positions as of December 12th will receive one share of Nextbridge Hydrocarbons Inc. for every one share of MMTLP held. The subject here is shareholders. The action is holding MMTLP and receiving Nextbridge Hydrocarbons shares. Purchases of MMTLP executed after December 8, 2022 will not receive the distribution. The subject here is a potential investor. The action was buying after December 8 and not receiving the distribution. Symbol, MMTLP will be deleted effective December 13, 2022. This we know is FINRA's role. The entire corporate action leaves out the roles of Meta Materials and Nextbridge Hydrocarbons. This really is FINRA's corporate action to delete the MMMTLP symbol. FINRA made no effort to fix the December 6th corporate action. They hijacked it. Did Meta Materials get a refund? Is there another way to explain why the December 8th MMTLP corporate action didn't comply with SEA Rule 10 B17? If Rule 6490 was followed, how did two problematic corporate actions make it to FINRA's daily list? Doesn't it seem like FINRA's main focus was to just make sure they could get the MMTLP symbol deleted? Hear me out. First, FINRA waits to put out the corporate action. Then we later find out that Pete Sessions of all people contacted FINRA and convinced them to get it processed. If settlement and clearance were at all a concern, and if protecting investors was FINRA's priority, why include a line in both corporate actions suggesting that purchases could be made after December 8th? Why remove two full trading days from the timeline? The effective date of both corporate actions was the zero hour of December 13th. If FINRA used a December 14th cancellation date on the first MMTLP corporate action and an effective date of December 14th after close, that's a difference of two trading days. This would have been plenty of time to settle any position close, only trades that would have occurred on December 9th and December 12th. In this court filing, I found it particularly interesting that FINRA used the following wording about the MMTLP corporate action. In March 2023, FINRA published an Investor Insights article on its website explaining FINRA's role in corporate actions generally and answering questions about the Meta Materials corporate action and the trading halt that FINRA imposed on December 9th, 2022. This is in reference to the March 16th FAQ released by FINRA. If you didn't catch it, they said that in this FAQ, FINRA explains their role in corporate actions generally. This is another way of saying, this is how FINRA usually does it, or this how FINRA does it in most cases. I think what we have here is an example of an attorney understanding the seriousness of lying in this court filing and intentionally using a word like generally so that it can be open to interpretation. This is as good a time as any to direct the FSIO to FINRA Rule 2020. In case you're unaware, FINRA Rule 2020 is about the use of manipulative, deceptive or other fraudulent devices. It's a short rule, but also very clear. It goes as follows. No member shall effect any transaction in or induce the purchase or sale of any security by means of any manipulative, deceptive or other fraudulent device or contrivance. Thousands of investors believed that they had until December 12, 2022 to decide if they were going to either hold their shares of MMTLP 
or attempt to sell their shares of MMTLP if they chose to do so. They believed this because according to FINRA, their Rule 6490 was followed and the corporate action that was posted to the daily list didn't have any issues. They believed this because the VP of OTC Markets at the time, Jeff Mendel, and Trader TV Live host Brendan Wickens understood the corporate action in the same way they did. They believed this because even after the revision on December 8th, the messaging from their brokers remained unchanged. So I would ask the FSIO, how else would you describe the MMTLP corporate actions posted to the daily list by FINRA, if not manipulative, deceptive and fraudulent? Here we'll go over some of the ways FINRA has attempted to hide the truth that has always been in plain sight. On the U3 halt notice for MMTLP, FINRA continued to further deceive the investing public and their member firms by continuing to conflate symbol deletion and share cancellation. On the December 9th UPC halt notice, FINRA informs the public that the U3 halt of MMTLP will end concurrently with the deletion of the symbol on December 13th. They then provide a link to the revised corporate action that they posted to their daily list less than 24 hours earlier. Then, directly below that, FINRA uses See Also to direct the reader to the next bridge hydrocarbons form S1 registration statement. FINRA specifically quotes the S1 as follows. Immediately after the spin-off, all shares of Series A non-voting preferred stock of Meta shall be cancelled. This is then followed by a link to the S1 where this quote can be found. This is where the deception takes place. At the time of this notice, FINRA was yet to offer a correction for the incorrect December 13th share cancellation date from the December 6th MMTLP corporate action. Remember, in both of the Metamaterials corporate action, PRs, they make it clear that the dates from FINRA superseded all prior disclosures. This is why on December 9th, TD Ameritrade was still informing their clients that December 13th was the share cancellation date. So going back to the halt notice, FINRA says the halt will end concurrently with the deletion of the symbol on December 13th. And they link to the December 8th corporate action where it says the MMTLP symbol will be deleted on December 13th. Then directly below that, as if to say to the reader, in case you don't believe us, look at what the S1 says. They point to the S1 and they provide a link, but they don't include a date. When you click the link FINRA provided, it takes you here. This is the line that FINRA quoted on the halt notice, but have you noticed anything missing? There are no dates. FINRA could have easily provided a link to the November 23rd announcement from Metamaterials, but by linking to this version of the S1, it gives the impression that FINRA's goal was to confuse the reader into believing symbol deletion and share cancellation were both intended to take place on December 13th. FINRA didn't correctly refer to the December 14th MMTLP share cancellation date until their March 16th, 2023 FAQ. In this FAQ, the word cancelled appears 12 times, the December 14th date appears seven times. Every time that December 14th appears in the March 16th FAQ, it's in relation to MMTLP share cancellation or a combination of share cancellation and distribution. Now, if you search cancelled in FINRA's November 6th supplemental FAQ, you'll see that it appears seven times. But if you search for December 14th, how many times would you think it appears? It doesn't appear at all. The same can also be said for December 13th. Keep in mind that this supplemental FAQ was released eight months after the initial FAQ. If I didn't know any better, it appears that a conscious effort went into not including those two dates. Similar to when FINRA modified their first FAQ shortly after it was released, the excuse they gave was something along the lines of the information wasn't pertinent and it was leading to further questions. Here again, it seems like FINRA is trying to avoid some questions. This theory is further supported by Robert W. Cook's January 31st, 2024 response to the Honourable Ralph Norman and over 70 more members of Congress. In this response, Cook appears to include both MMTLP FAQS as an addendum. It didn't take long, however, to realise that the initial March 16th FAQ was not included. Instead, the November 6th supplemental FAQ was included twice. Furthermore, in the entire 32-page response from Robert W. Cook, December 14th doesn't appear at all. To remind you of the significance of this date, 
December 14th was the pay slash distribution date for the next bridge hydrocarbons shares, the share cancellation date for the shares of MMTLP, and December 14th should have also been the effective date of the corporate action. For all of these actions, they were supposed to take place after market close. Are you starting to understand what really happened here? December 13th appears three times in the 32-page response. Once in reference to the MMTLP symbol being deleted, once in reference to the limitation on settlement, and once unrelated to the corporate action. FINRA Rule 11.893, clearly erroneous transactions in OTC equity securities. This one is a bit nuanced, but I believe it applies in the case of MMTLP. Investors that watched MMTLP might have remembered multiple instances in which the price moved outside of the normal OTC market trading hours. The investing public doesn't have the ability to trade OTC securities in pre-market or post-market hours. While there are reasonable explanations for some trades that might occur directly before and or directly after market hours, what we witnessed with MMTLP during the pre-market hours of December 8th, 2022, appears to have been an example, blatant coordinated manipulation. MTLP opened at a price of $9.90 on December 7th. The closing price was $7. The price was trending down just over 14%, even though notices from multiple brokerages have indicated the potential consequences of not closing short positions voluntarily. If this price activity represents investors selling, one might wonder why they'd be selling at this particular time, unless they were privy to some information not publicly available. What occurred during the pre-market hours of December 8th, for the most part, rules out investors selling as being the cause of the price drop. In the image here, we can see that at 8.40 Eastern Time, 50 minutes before the market would have opened for trading OTC securities, the price of MMTLP was already down 15% to $5.95. It's also interesting that depending on the website or source used to view the price at that time, you might have only been shown the $7 closing price from the day prior. Here we can see the $7 price on Google and then Yahoo, followed by the actual price on MarketWatch. This 15% price drop appears to be coordinated because according to FINRA's rule, 11893 numerical guidelines, Transactions resulting in at least a 15% difference could have been declared null and void if an officer of FINRA's market regulation department determined the transactions were clearly erroneous, or for the maintenance of a fair and orderly market, or the protection of investors and the public interest. The rule stipulates that the officer should take action as soon as possible, once aware of the situation, but no later than 3 p.m. Eastern time on the next trading day. Even if we disregard that aspect of the rule, there's also an additional factor section which includes more reasons to flag this activity. It reads, A FINRA officer may also consider additional factors to determine whether a transaction is clearly erroneous, including but not limited to system malfunctions or disruptions, volume and volatility for the security, derivative securities products that correspond to greater than 100% in the direction of a tracking index, news released for the security, whether trading in the security was recently halted, resumed, whether the security is an IPO, whether the security was subject to a stock split, reorganization or other corporate action, overall market conditions, opening and late session executions, validity of the consolidated tapes, trades and quotes, consideration of primary market indications, and executions inconsistent with the trading pattern in the stock. Each additional factor shall be considered with a view toward maintaining a fair and orderly market and the protection of investors and the public interest. Essentially, a FINRA officer has an almost infinite number of reasons to declare a transaction erroneous, including a security being recently halted or resumed, opening and late session executions, and when a security is subject to a corporate action. The fact that this pre-market activity occurred on what we now know as the last trading day, FINRA very likely investigated the full day of trading activity of on December 8th. How could they have not? Why didn't FINRA determine the December 8th MMTLP pre-market activity to be clearly erroneous? MMTLP opened at $6.15 on December 8th. The final price was $2.89, a nearly 60% drop overall. 
If investors were selling their shares of MMTLP on this day, there's a strong likelihood that the price drop precipitated by pre-market trading likely contributed to investors possibly thinking that there was a reason to sell. I'm of the opinion that the majority of this volume wasn't due to investors selling. The MMTLP community firmly believes that an unbiased inspection of the trading data will reveal manipulative trading activity via methods unavailable to the investing public. FINRA seemingly looking the other way while the price of MMTLP was manipulated downward before the start of the December 8th trading day is a clear example of market makers being shown preferential treatment. Multiple members of the MMTLP community held shares on the E-Trade platform. Many of them have shared that their good till cancelled orders were filled after December 8th. This aligns with this response from E-Trade to a client as to what type of solution would be employed regarding short positions that needed to be closed. Did FINRA utilise Rule 11893 to reverse these orders that were too late to be cancelled? If so, it shows that the interests of FINRA appear to align with the interests of their member firms. If we direct our attention back to the response from Gary Gensler, the last part of the paragraph reads, without influence from conflicts of interest, Seeing what we've seen since FINRA U3 halted MMTLP, it's very difficult to believe that a capable investigative body determined to discover the truth hasn't seen the same potential conflicts of interest that we have. Here's where things get especially interesting. This is a view of MMTLP Level 2 activity on December 8th. Unless an examination of the trading data reveals otherwise, there were only these three market participants. GTS Securities, can accord genuity and the market maker for the OTC market. Just look at the 50K bid from the OTC. What's that about? If nothing else, it points to GTS and can accord as likely being responsible for the 15% drop. The OTC market maker appears to have been posturing for an opportunity to get a multitude of shares for a very cheap price. And here we can see a message from TD Ameritrade to a client from October 24th, 2021 just days after the Series A, preferred share became tradable on the OTC as MMTLP. In this message, the representative explains to the client what they've been able to discover regarding the first trades in MMTLP. The two market makers mentioned here are GTS Securities and Canaccord Genuity. We'll discuss this conversation in later in the video, but here, the purpose is to establish the fact that GTS Securities and Canaccord Genuity have at least been involved with MMTLP from inception, all the way to the last day it traded on the OTC. As I've mentioned before, these are only observations, these are not accusations. The information presented here is intended to aid the FSIO and any other investigative body in their pursuit of the truth and to provide an adequate and favourable resolution for the investors harmed by the unjust U3 halt of MMTLP. Ari Rubinstein is the co-founder and chief executive officer of GTS Securities. GTS trades more than 500,000 financial instruments globally and is a leading designated market maker at the New York Stock Exchange. On any given day, the proprietary systems at GTS can algorithmically trade a billion shares of US equities via their retail and ETF market making business. According to their website, GTS touches virtually every trading household in the United States. Imagine the problem this could create if the firm sought to engage in market manipulation. This is what Rubenstein's broker check used to look like on the left, and on the right is how it currently looks. A multi-year New York Stock Exchange investigation came to an end in April of 2023. The investigation concluded that from the period of approximately September 2016 to April 7, 2022, GTS Securities violated multiple NYSE ARCA rules that fit the category of price spoofing, late close violations, and failing to provide timely and accurate information in the course of the investigation. These seven GTS Securities employees, including Rubenstein, were all subjects of the investigation. In the end, GTS signed an acceptance waiver and consent in which they had to pay fines up to $10 million and agree to third-party supervision for a period of 18 months. Two of the seven employees, Jingli Jenny Joe and Yaron Katz, appear to have taken the blame for the spoofing, and they were each fined $150,000 each. Pop quiz time. In what business can you cause your employer to lose $10 million while you get to continue working there? You give up? Apparently, it's the market-making business. 
both Jenny and Yaron still work for GTS Securities. My guess is that GTS made quite a hefty sum from their six years of market manipulation. I wouldn't be surprised if GTS paid their fines and maybe gave them a bonus for being team players. I'm referring to a couple of extra paid days off, of course. And if that wasn't strange enough. On November 29th, 2022, GTS Securities and their in-house technology provider, Strike Technologies, partnered with Google Cloud to provide a spoofing detection solution. This is just five months before GTS would have to pay $10 million for a manipulation cocktail that included spoofing. This is directly from the blog post. Market surveillance is getting more complex as deceptive trading practices increase with higher trading volume and the emergence of new asset classes. One such deceptive practice is spoofing, which largely revolves around the intent, or lack thereof, of traders to place bona fide orders. Devoid of any premeditation to cancel a particular order, before or at the time of its placement. Flashing is a form of market spoofing, where market participants exhibit a pattern of submitting orders that are not intended to be fulfilled, but rather only to move, improve the market, to benefit a subsequent order on the other side of the market. The flashed orders are short-lived orders, which are cancelled quickly after being entered and before getting executed. In the world of electronic trading, order entry is fully automated and typically happens within milliseconds or microseconds. This is still available for companies to use. It either doesn't work or GTS doesn't use it in their own operation. Here's Ari Rubenstein on his first day as designated market maker on the New York Stock Exchange, April 4th, 2016. If you recall the New York Stock Exchange spoofing violation, it was for a period of approximately September 2016 to April 7th, 2022. This means that nearly the entire time that GTS Securities was on the NYSE, they've potentially been engaged in some form of market manipulation. But wait, there's more. GTS Securities and Canaccord Genuity are named in at least two spoofing lawsuits relating to OTC Securities, NWBO and GTITU. I find it difficult to understand how they can attempt to defend themselves for the same crime after impeding an investigation on the NYSE and ultimately paying a large sum just to make the problem go away. Ari Rubenstein's GTS Securities has a history of disclosures on the various exchanges on which they have conducted business. I don't bring up these cases in an attempt to portray his firm as villainous. I do so because the evidence the MMTLP community has uncovered appears to point to him. I can go on and on about how the GTS and Canaccord offices are within walking distance both in New York and in London, or how Canaccord has a history fraudulent 211 listings. I can bring up Ari Rubenstein's February 2020 comment letter to Vanessa Countryman, where he moans about how burdensome Rule 15C211 can be on market makers and how there should be more piggyback exemptions so that market makers can list derivatives like preferred shares. But I won't. I'm just trying to point out what appears to be a conflict of interest or two or three. Current head of enforcement at FINRA. Bill St. Louis had this to say about spoofing when Bank of America was fined $24 million for the practice. Spoofing undermines the transparency and integrity of the markets by distorting the true nature of supply and demand. Spoofing is especially detrimental in the US Treasury securities market given its status as a benchmark for countless financial instruments and transactions. The $10 million fine levied against GTS securities by the NYSE for a similar span of years seems like quite the deal in comparison. Since I've brought up the current head of enforcement, now might be a good time to bring up something I've noticed. Jessica Hopper was head of enforcement at the time of the U3 halt. A little more than a month afterwards, on January 24th, FINRA announced she'd be stepping down on February 3rd, that's barely a week's notice. This was also just two weeks before FINRA released the first MMTLP FAQ. Surely Jessica Hopper knew the truth of what occurred. As FINRA's head of enforcement, she was their top cop, as Gary Gensler liked to put it. Did she not agree with the content of the pending FAQ? Did she insist that FINRA waited until her departure before releasing the FAQ? What about her responsibility to protect investors? With 18 years at FINRA, how close was she to receiving her pension? There was a brief period between her departure until learning where she landed where I held out hope that she'd speak up on the behalf of investors. Instead, we learned that she took a position at Edward Jones, where she gets to diligently work from home. 
When Jessica Hopper left, Christopher Kelly became the interim replacement. He only lasted six months before the position was officially given to Bill St. Louis. Christopher Kelly worked closely with Hopper and her predecessor, Susan Schroeder, for many years. I believe strongly that Kelly was offered the position, but turned it down. If you thought Hopper's departure was abrupt, FINRA announced that Christopher Kelly was leaving FINRA on October 31st, 2023. He left the very next day. Not only that, but in what I imagine was a who's coming with me type situation, Lisa Cologne, also from FINRA enforcement, vacated her position. Just five days later, FINRA released their supplemental FAQ for MMTLP. This is the one that removed all mention of December 13th and December 14th. Could it be that Kelly didn't agree with the content in the pending release? Christopher Kelly and Lisa Cologne have both joined Chiesa Shahinian and Giantomasi PC as members and chair of their securities enforcement group. I'm certain their experience at FINRA will make them all assets to their new firms. Back to Bill St. Louis. Bill has been with FINRA for 26 years in a variety of roles. Something tells me that when he leaves FINRA, it won't be to go to another firm. Bill gives me the impression that he's loyal to a fault, a real team player. Congratulations on your promotion, Bill. I do find it concerning, though, that in his recent FINRA unscripted appearance, he mentions that he's only met half of the enforcement staff. It's been six months. Ari didn't tweet a lot, but he did have a presence. He no longer has any activity on LinkedIn, and he's never in any pictures on the GTS Securities LinkedIn account. If you search him on YouTube, he was a very visible figure. He clearly appears to like the industry that he's in. For some reason, though, it appears that he's disappeared. Unless I'm mistaken, the last event that he's known to have attended was this May 2022 Milken event. I found this tweet exchange involving Virtue Financial CEO to be interesting. The tweet he was responding to was deleted, but seems to have been something along the lines of asking about Ari's whereabouts. Doug Sifu's response was, unlike me, Ari is smart enough to avoid this sewer. Is he though? Here's something interesting about Ari's last post on the X platform. It was a post from Ari to Doug Sifu in support of Virtue Financial's lawsuit against the SEC. That's not the interesting part though. Have a look at the date, November 30th, 2022. That's the same day that George Palikara shared that he met with FINRA and let his requests known concerning the MMTLP corporate action. Ari Rubenstein and Doug Sifu aren't just associates, their firms have been in business together since at least September 2021 by way of Clearlist. By being in business together, I'm certain they communicate outside of social media. So in many ways, so you can kind of read between the lines in regards to Sifu deciding to enter the conversation as well as the things he's had to say and possibly retract in the future. Around the time of the halt, there was a professor that engaged with the community claiming to be an investor in TARCH and or MMTLP. He was very vocal in his displeasure with the issuer and his inability to trade his next bridge shares. He was fairly active in letting his opinion be known, but his viewpoint didn't align with the other investors in the MMTLP community. We'd soon discover that as a professor at Georgetown University, the program he's involved in has very close ties to FINRA. He has an extensive history in finance, including as a visiting academic fellow in residence at the National Association of Securities Dealers, now known as FINRA, and he's a member of the OTC Bulletin Board Advisory Committee. Legend has it that James Angel purchases one of every stock in the stock market for his research. If true, then there is validity to him, referring to himself as an MMTLP shareholder, but to use being a holder of a single share his background, education and influence as leveraged to attempt to push his own narrative was disingenuous. Early on, when the MMTLP community began to visit Washington, D.C., they soon learned that many of the staffers they met with and many of the offices that they visited were also being visited by Professor James Angel. This was indeed a slap in the face because Angel has already had a history of briefing Congress on matters related to the market it was almost like he was sent to thwart the progress of the community. He even prepared a slideshow with a variety of inaccuracies and insults aimed towards the true investors that held MMTLP. More digging resulted in learning that Professor Angel is a holder of patents that are related to dark pool technology and allegedly utilised by Virtue Financial. More digging and the community discovered that Ari Rubenstein has cited James Angel's work in his comment letters. 
Even more digging revealed that James Angel is an advisor for Modern Markets Initiative, MMI. A Modern Markets Initiative is basically a lobbyist group started by high-frequency trading firms to advocate for matters related to high-frequency trading. Who is a co-founder of MMI, Ari Rubenstein? As an employee of MMI, James Angel was literally paid to advocate for the interests of GTS Securities and the other member firms. But curiously, when you look at the slideshow that Angel presented to congressional staffers, it's emblazoned with the Georgetown University logo. Within the slideshow, there's an About Me section, but he manages to leave out the fact that he was employed by MMI. Was it Georgetown University that commissioned Angel to brief congressional staffers about MMTLP? If so, why would they? He gets the days of the week wrong. But aside from that, he only focuses on the fact that December 12th was the intended record date. If he's the unbiased expert he claims to be, why didn't he point out that the December 14th share cancellation date on the November 23rd PR didn't match the December 13th share cancellation date on the December 6th corporate action? Why didn't he point out that symbol deletion wasn't mentioned in December 23rd PR? It's difficult to see what Professor Angel presented and not get the impression that he was participating in a cover-up. This is especially concerning due to recent evidence suggesting that he's recently been the recipient of over a million dollars from USA Spending, dot, G-O-V. Around the time that MMI was founded, Ari was asked why it was necessary for a high-frequency trading advocacy group. Included in his response was, we will respond in real time to debunk myths and spurious media reports. The case of the thin skin professor is just another example of Ari Rubenstein appearing to remain quiet, while someone he's seemingly connected to attempts to discredit the MMTLP assets and community. And check this out. In August of 2022, Ari Rubenstein quote tweets a post from from his own Modern Markets Initiative. The MMI post attempts to counter Gary Gensler's argument for banning payment for order flow. When you view the article, you'll notice that there's a quote from James Angel. The entire portion reads, it's a study that I wish I had done, says Georgetown University finance professor James Angel, who wasn't involved in the research. Different brokers do different jobs in execution quality. These differences are not driven solely by payment for order flow. This was just four months before the U3 halt of MMTLP, Ari Rubenstein utilizing James Angel to support his views and James Angel conveniently leaving out that he's employed by Ari Rubenstein's MMI. Could just be another coincidence, though. Alexander Alsopovich is a writer for the Wall Street Journal. Long after the halt, he just one day decided to write disparaging things about MMTLP, the oil assets, and the community. This was both on the Wall Street Journal website and on the X platform. It didn't take long for the community to discover that his articles had been featured on the GTS Securities website and that Ari Rubenstein cited his work in comment letters. Ari himself even contributed to the Wall Street Journal as a guest writer. This can easily be a coincidence. Brandon Cockcodin contributes articles to the Forbes website and he's also written multiple articles and engaged with the MMTLP community on social media with similar narrative as Alsopovich. I think Brandon's proudest achievement is a comic strip that he played a role in creating. It apparently was Forbes' first ever comic strip editorial, but it was full of inaccuracies and demeaning remarks about Nextbridge Hydrocarbons, the assets and investors. The community later discovered from a LinkedIn post that Forbes spent six months creating the piece. Isn't that an inordinate amount of time to spend on a story about a security that isn't trading but has negatively impacted thousands of families? Also on LinkedIn, You'll notice that Professor James Angel appears to be a fan of Osopovich and Kotkodin. This too can be just a coincidence. Investor Place is barely worth mentioning, but James Angel is quoted in this MMTLP hit piece from July 2023. I'm not going to point out what's wrong with what Angel says here. Instead, I want to point out the editor's note. It seems James Angel wanted to make it clear that he's paid by Georgetown University to be the academic director for the FINRA Certified Regulatory and Compliance Professional Programme and not by FINRA. I guess because making that clear removes the impression that there's a conflict of interest. Any guesses why he didn't ask to include that he was employed by MMI, which was founded by one of the market makers, suspected of making MMTLP tradable? For some odd reason, in June of 2023, Six months after the U3 halt of MMTLP, Jim Cramer went on live television. 
fumbled through a bunch of pages and rambled off a string of words that didn't make sense aside from the narrative he was seemingly instructed to push. If you have the opportunity to watch it, pay attention to the two other hosts on the broadcast. One is completely disinterested and kind of needed to be awakened when Kramer attempts to give him a cue. The other guy just makes awkward facial expressions like he understands what Kramer is talking about. My assumption is that the two guys on each side of Jim Kramer knew that he was going to integrate this into the conversation somehow, but they weren't aware of how he'd do it. When you watch the clip, it's obvious that Kramer didn't know how he'd do it. The context one of the hosts is asking why Gary Gensler wasn't protecting people on Robin Hood with 500 bucks but didn't know what they were doing. Kramer responds with, well, that's caveat emptor. Binance isn't caveat emptor. He then says something unintelligible about Sam Bankman Freed. Then he continues, caveat emptor is been the law of the land for the way it's always been. Caveat emptor being like, hey, if you're gonna be stupid enough to buy MMTL, what is my favorite stock now? At this point, Kramer reaches for papers and flips through them. Kramer continues, that MMTLP that my says name I couldn't make out, he's our expert on some of the more obscure situations that we look at. And there had been an MMTLP Oil Texas Energy Company that was the Torchlight Energy merger with Metamaterials the Canadian. And FINRA removed it. Well, that was a short squeeze gone bad. They blamed the regulators. They never blamed themselves. Then he rambles off something about Brutus and Caesar and then ends with dynamite. It really needs to be seen to be believed. It's obvious that he was given talking points from someone about MMTLP being caveat emptor and that investors blame FINRA instead of taking responsibility for their actions. For clarity, MMTLP traded for more than a year. OTC Markets gave MMTLP the caveat emptor designation on December 8th, shortly after FINRA confusingly posted a revised MMTLP corporate action. The caveat emptor notice from OTC Markets cited potential confusion related to the first and second corporate actions. So why would Jim Cramer go on live television to hastily and incoherently spew gibberish about the MMTLP situation? Jim Cramer answers this question himself in an interview from a long time ago. He seems to share a number of illegal activities that he engaged in while being short or long at a hedge fund. This is what Cramer had to say. What's important when you're in that hedge fund mode is not do anything remotely truthful, because the truth is so against your view that it's important to create a new truth to develop a fiction. In the same video, he speaks on reaching out to the journal, presumably the Wall Street Journal, and feeding information to the Bozo reporter for things to write about. This is eerily similar to what appears to be the relationship between GTS Securities and Wall Street Journal writer Alexander Orsopovich. The irony here is that now Jim Cramer appears to be playing the bozo. Also, if we go back to the images from the Squawk Box broadcast, what do you see in the top left-hand corner? That's the GTS Securities logo. Now that Jim Cramer has explained their playbook, it's easy to recognize the obvious instructions given to Charles Gasparino. More than a year after the halt, Gasparino has seemingly made putting down the MMTLP community his life goal. He might have been deployed to counter the contributions of Wise Guy's host, Johnny Tobacco, whom Gasparino himself has credited as being an expert. Gasparino has repeatedly made posts saying that the MMTLP community didn't understand T plus two, that they didn't read the PR, but for the longest time, he wouldn't explain which PR he was referring to. Then Gasparino finally made this post, highlighting a PR from Metamaterials on December 7th. This PR was literally Metamaterials announcing that FINRA has processed a corporate action for the series A Preferred Share Exchange. This PR came out a day after FINRA posted the first corporate action to their daily list. And as I've shown earlier, FINRA's corporate action was inconsistent with every the key word being every prior description of the dates from the issuer beforehand. If that isn't enough, Gasparino ignores the disclaimer on that same PR directly below the text of the corporate action. It reads, please note that this disclosure and dates from FINRA, again from FINRA, regarding the trading of MMTLP in connection with the distribution of the shares of Nextbridge Hydrocarbons Inc. supersedes and replaces again, supersedes and replaces all of Meta's prior disclosure regarding the logistics and timing of the trading of MMTLP in connection with the distribution. The whole basis for Gasparino claiming that MMTLP investors didn't read the PR and that T plus two wouldn't work is based on a PR from Metamaterials explaining what FINRA posted to their daily list a day prior. 
He disregards the fact that FINRA revised the corporate action a day later, but he also illustrates the confusion that FINRA caused. You see, the revised MMTLP corporate action didn't include a share cancellation date, so Gasparino is relying on what appeared on the first corporate action, which was December 13th. But this date is incorrect. FINRA repeatedly says in their March 16th FAQ that the MMTLP shares were cancelled on December 14th. Metamaterials went a step further to protect their investors, in my opinion, when they included this line directly below that disclaimer on the same PR. Please contact your broker, bank or other nominee for assistance with any questions concerning ownership or trading of Meta's Series A preferred shares. This is exactly what people did, whether they read that line on the PR or not. The investors slash holders of MMTLP didn't just rely on their interpretation of the corporate actions, they called their brokerages and each one explained how trading would work after December 8th. Brokerages recognised the limitation created by December 13th share cancellation date and they stipulated that investors wouldn't have the option to buy MMTLP after December 8th. According to multiple brokerages, December 9th and December 12th were to be position close only trading. This falls in line with the sentence included in both MMTLP corporate actions that clearly stated that purchasers of MMTLP after December 8th wouldn't be entitled to the distribution. Why would a brokerage with fiduciary responsibility to their clients allow them to purchase MMTLP after December 8th? Why has Charles Gasparino devoted so much time attempting to belittle holders of MMTLP? Gasparino, like Alexander Ausopovich, also worked for the Wall Street Journal. Trader Zero appears to have some level of understanding about the stock market, but has a habit of posting these long and boring posts on the X platform, where he mixes fact and fiction in an attempt to discredit John Burda and the MMTLP community. This post here is a prime example. He begins with something that sounds factual about brokers having the responsibility of initiating position close only trading, that they can do so with any security and that it isn't a market mechanism. This doesn't help FINRA's argument, but it reinforces the fact that brokerages responded to the wording of the corporate action by planning to only allow MMTLP to be traded position close only after December 8th. The fourth paragraph is all you need to read to confirm that this person has zero credibility. It goes, think it through, start with T plus two, everyone knows this. Then go back to MMAT filings and the other notices with December 13th listed as the date they delete MMTLP well before the corporate action. Which filings and notices from before the corporate action include a December 13th deletion date? Why does this person provide zero proof of what he's saying? Why point out that position close only isn't a typical market mechanic, but gloss over the fact that the settlement issue was ignored during FINRA's Rule 6490 review process and an extraordinary event U3 Holt was used to end trading? Wouldn't it have made more sense to clearly indicate the last day of trading? Michael Piwawa was acting chair of the SEC from January 20th, 2017 to May 4th, 2017. He was an SEC commissioner for five years and in his early career, he was a staffer for senators Mike Crapo and Richard Shelby. On the topic of GameStop, Robin Hood and retail investors, Michael Piwawa testified before the Senate Banking Committee on March 9th, 2021, and before the House Financial Services Committee on March 17th, 2021 in a March 22nd, 2021 article from Wall Street on Parade titled, There's a plot sucking more retail traders at the top of a bubble market. The article points out that in both testimonies, Piwawa neglected to mention that he was employed by Ari Rubenstein's GTS Securities as a senior advisor. This is similar behavior exhibited by fellow Georgetown University alumnus James Angel when he left out his connection to the high-frequency lobbyist organization founded by Ari Rubenstein, Modern Markets Initiative. In Piwawa's testimony, he made it clear that he was testifying on his own behalf, but the Wall Street on Parade article points out that he manages to campaign for an adjustment to the definition of an accredited investor. Piwawa uses his former position as an SEC commissioner to advocate for lower income households to have access to riskier investments because of the potential for higher returns and a level playing field. Who stands to benefit by changing the definition of an accredited investor is Ari Rubenstein, who's also the founder of Clearlist, an alternative trading system or ATS, specifically for the trading of private company securities. Doug Sifu's Virtue Financial 
is also an investor in the platform, as mentioned earlier. Rubenstein made a similar plea in a 2019 op-eared in Barron's titled Give Main Street Investors a Piece of the Startup Action. And so there can be no confusion that Piwawa was aware of the clear list, ATS. He has the following quote in an article titled Clearlist announces an equities marketplace for private companies. Clearlist solves a long-standing problem of limited retail access to the private markets and opaque valuations for many private companies. Democratizing investor access to the private markets and fair pricing will be an important contributor to strengthening our capital markets ecosystem. The difference here is that in addition to disclosing Piwawa's former roles as acting chair and SEC commissioner, they also include that he's a senior advisor for GTS Securities. According to the risks disclosures for Clear List, affiliations, GTS Securities and or GTS Execution Services may place orders on both sides of a market for private company securities traded on the Clear List ATS. This is particularly concerning given that GTS has a long history of spoofing, allowing millions of investors onto an ATS such as Clear List where the affiliate can potentially manipulate trades with a fraction of the oversight sounds disastrous. So in addition to being a senior advisor for GTS Securities, Piwa has been with the Milken Institute for the past five years. And at one of their May 2022 events in Beverly Hills, we had one of the last sightings of Ari Rubenstein. A community member even noticed that Charles Gasparino and Ari Rubenstein were mentioned together at the event. Gasparino was quick to make it seem not very noteworthy. The following email was sent to TD Ameritrade on October 8th, 2021. It comes from a concerned investor that once held a non-tradable Series A preferred share placeholder. It's important to note that at this time, Series A preferred holders still had the expectation that the Torchlight assets would be sold by year end. You'll soon see the significance of TD Ameritrade's response, but as you hear the contents of the initial message, you can get a glimpse into the frustration that so many investors faced on that day. The message begins, I know you guys have probably received a ton of inquiries on this subject already, but I would like to know what is going on with ticker symbol MMTLP. These have seemingly started trading and I'm not quite sure why. The issue I have with this suddenly trading is that these were nothing more than placebo placeholders that were in our accounts and are not supposed to trade nor were they supposed to show any value until TRCH finishes the sale of their assets post-merger. I currently hold 72,000 of these special dividend series, A preferred shares through TD, so it's particularly concerning to me when I see that it's showing tradable as an OTC pinky and holds a value of 70 cents per share. This screams of a fraudulent act and is most certainly illegal given the information issued in the SEC filings as per the Torchlight Metamaterials merger reverse split that finalised a few months ago. I believe this needs to be investigated on behalf of the true and actual holders of these preferred shares due to the fact that TD is allowing clients to close their positions on your platforms, but we are currently not able to actually purchase these shares on the OTC markets via any TD platform. Unfortunately, as a result of this, I'm reading on various outlets that clients who have been holding these placeholders in their accounts and are now seeing this fabricated value attached to them, are mistakenly believing that the TRCH assets have been sold and they are selling their positions for pennies on the dollar. Both the CEOs of Metamaterials and Torchlight, respectively, have stated publicly that they did not approve these for trade, and this is not the dividend we're going to receive, as the TRCH assets have, in fact, not been sold yet. As a matter of fact, this dividend was only issued to a finite number of investors who purchased TRTH shares before the, the June 22nd cutoff date. Please explain to me how a finite number of shares being held as placeholders in a finite number of accounts suddenly became a tradable security on the OTC marketplace. I phoned TD earlier regarding this matter and was told that they had no knowledge of this MMTLP ticker being traded, even as I was watching it trade institutionally on level two in real time and have screen recorded this action for my records. I'm very confused how a market maker would go about creating a market for a special dividend preferred share that held no value and for which a market should not feasibly exist due to this supposedly being non-tradable. And to add insult to injury, all of these investors who purchased Torchlight shares and held through the merger reverse split as the price ran up to $12, 
gave up easy profits in lieu of the anticipation of a greater payout by the end of the year when TRH assets are sold. Now it seems as though we never really needed to hold these through the merger at all if we can theoretically just purchase them for 70 cents because someone has created a market for them regardless. I will also be sending all of my records regarding this matter to the regulatory agencies pertinent to the aforementioned issues. Finally, most relevant to TD Ameritrade, let me say that because I own these placeholders in a fully cash account and have never purchased anything with margin on TD, I emphatically do not give my consent nor my permission for TD to lend out or sell any of my shares of MMTLP or whatever this placeholder is in my account. If you know what is going on with this issue, I would very much appreciate some more information, please. I have plenty of friends and associates who have prematurely sold their positions and are seeking information as to why they are trading, even though no TRCH assets have been sold. Thank you. Attached are pics of the stock in question trading on the OTC markets. Good day. Before we get to the TD Ameritrade response, take note of the fact that when MMTLP became tradable, you could only sell on TD Ameritrade. On platforms like Robinhood and Webull, you were always only allowed to sell. But later, TD Ameritrade allowed their clients the option to buy as well. This is important because you can really see how this might have given people the impression that this was their dividend as the only option was to sell. Also, it shows you that like Robinhood and Webull, among others, TD Ameritrade was perfectly capable of providing a position close only environment where their clients only have the option to sell MMTLP. This is potentially the trading environment that TD Ameritrade describes in this message to clients concerning what to expect on December 9th and December 12th. They take it step further when they indicate that if any new buying were to occur, those transactions would be reviewed and routed for cancellation. The response came six days later and it reads as follows. I apologize for the delay in response and for the frustration this, as well as the rejected trades for MMTLP has caused you. I've discussed the issue with our order room and was able to confirm why these trades were rejected. Currently, there's only one market destination accepting orders for MMTLP, which is GTS OTC. Unfortunately, our platform is not connected to this specific market destination for clients utilizing the Think or Swim platform and advanced trading features, which is why the orders you placed were rejected. Orders can be placed for this security. However, they would need to be completed through a broker as the orders have to be manually routed to this destination. You can reach our trade desk at 800-67-22098 and we can force this order through to GTS OTC. Please note, however, that the order will not show up in Think or Swim until we have confirmed a fill and our order room has updated the platform with the fill. As this is an OTC stock, only limit orders would be accepted for opening transactions. There was one order that was filled on October 8th, 2021, and I was able to confirm that our order room directly worked with a market destination, Can Accord listed as C. Stewart in the details of that specific order, to confirm that they would be accepting orders for this security. However, during that trading day, they stopped taking orders on it altogether. Unfortunately, we do not have information as to why they or other market destinations have chosen not to accept orders for MMTLP at this time. I hope that this provides some clarity regarding this matter. But if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact our trade desk 806 722098. What's unique about this exchange between TD Ameritrade and their client is that since it was so early on, literally the beginning of trading, the response from TD Ameritrade was uniquely transparent concerning the market makers involved in these initial MMTLP transactions. And though it isn't enough to definitively conclude that it was GTS Securities and or Canaccord Genuity that made the Series A share tradable, it at least tells you where to look. For example, the market destination Canaccord was listed as C. Stewart in the details of the order. Can Accord Genuity acquired Colin Stewart Hawkpoint, a London mid-cap stockbroker, in 2012. By mid-2013, it was rebranded under the Can Accord Genuity Wealth Management banner. Why would Can Accord Genuity be using the name of a long-defunct entity unless perhaps they didn't want an obvious paper trail leading back to Can Accord Genuity? 
if these so-called journalists or the good professor really wanted to learn the truth, why have they not once mentioned the suspected market makers? Why is it okay to make unsupported accusations about CEOs? It isn't wild speculation that GTS Securities and Canaccord Genuity appear to be involved. TD Ameritrade pointed the finger their way shortly after MMTLP began to trade. These messages between TD Ameritrade and their client have been circulating for more than a year, and John Bruder has repeatedly made it known that the information used to make the preferred share tradable was fraudulent. What does it tell you that no writer has gone back to offer a retraction or an update to their story? The GTS Securities disclosure for spoofing nearly their entire time on the New York Stock Exchange was entered into FINRA's broker check in April 2023. Anyone that put out negative material about MMTLP could have easily viewed the GTS and Can Accord broker check reports and seen that there's likely more to the story. GTS impeded that investigation, and though they neither had to admit or deny wrongdoing, the over $10 million in fines tells you all you need to know. Can Accord Genuity, using the defunct C. Stewart market destination and then ceasing to take orders, is like the equivalent of throwing rocks and then trying to hide your hand. Can Accord's history of fraudulent listings and their proximity to GTS, both domestically and internationally, if nothing else, it gives the appearance of collusion. And though the GTS spoofing disclosure appears on FINRA's broker check, the investigation wasn't initiated by FINRA, at some point it appears that FINRA no longer found any wrongdoing taking place at GTS. Either that or they just stopped looking. The fact that GTS and Can Accord were named in two spoofing lawsuits, one of which NWBO appears to be progressing beyond multiple attempted motions to dismiss. You would think FINRA would voluntarily investigate those two OTC securities which fall under their purview and offer those findings to the presiding judges in those cases. I mean, doesn't that sound like the actions that might be undertaken by an SRO claiming their purpose is investor protection and market integrity? In the Bank of America spoofing case from earlier, the spoofing took place from at least 2014 to 2022. Here's a picture of Eric Kriftcher, Bank of America's Managing Director and Associate General Counsel in the Global Banking and Markets Division since 2006. Eric and his team are primarily responsible for legal coverage in their fixed income sales, global trading business and mortgages. Fixed income stands out for some reason, and so does mortgages when you realise he once worked for Lehman Brothers. Next to Eric is FINRA's Head of Transparency, Chris Stone, and Elliot Levine Associate Vice President, Chief Counsel and Senior Advisor Transparency Services at FINRA's 2017 Annual Conference. Odds are that Bank of America has attended the majority of the conferences and continue to be welcomed with open arms. Granted, Eric Kriftcher likely had nothing to do with the spoofing at Bank of America. There was no reason for FINRA to treat Bank of America as a whole, any different due to the actions of a few. On the contrary, in Robert W. Cook's response to Congressman Ralph Norman, he manages to find a way to include a reference to eight individuals that coordinated via social media to pump and dump multiple securities, including TRCH. According to court filings, these individuals concluded their trading of TRCH in February 2021 when they sold below the $2.70 range. The point I'm trying to make is that it's unfair that Robert W. Cook seemingly attempts to attribute the actions of eight individuals to the 65,000 holders of TRCH that held through the merger. These 65,000 holders made a decision not to sell when TRCH went to $12 because they believed it to be more lucrative. That was not an example of a strategy used by pump and dumpers. Those that held MMTLP since the merger can't be accused of attempting to create a squeeze. The shares of MMTLP they held were never intended to become tradable. Likewise, for anyone that purchased MMTLP, they were only able to do so because FINRA ignored the issuer's complaints when the preferred share became tradable with fraudulent information. By now, you should have a level of insight concerning a number of individuals based on empirical evidence. The following is a series of events, not necessarily linear, that when combined with the aforementioned insight, provides the viewer with an account of how things might have transpired. To best understand Ari Rubinstein, we have to go back to his first investment in the stock market. According to this June 2016 Financial Times article, which I mostly paraphrase, in the 1980s, 
Ari used the $4,000 he received from his bar mitzvah, money intended for college, to enter the market. Using his father's Charles Schwab account, he bought calls in Texaco, an American oil company believed to be the target of a takeover. When Carl Icahn made an offer for the company, Ari's profits on paper were $30,000. It doesn't feel right, he said to his dad, but he held on only to see the options expire worthless when the deal didn't pan out. From that experience, he learned three things. One, that markets are brutally honest. No matter how much work you do, the markets operate independently. Two, you have to trust your gut, sometimes over meticulous analysis. And three, losing money is very, very scary. You have to be prepared to make difficult decisions. Quite ironic that Ari's first trade was an oil company and that it didn't go as planned. Even more ironic are the three lessons he claimed he learned. The markets are brutally honest, but what happens when you try to hide that truth? Investors in MMTLP have merely asked for a share count, but instead of getting it, we've gotten FINRA and the SEC pretending as though they don't know exactly what we mean. You have to trust your gut. Was Ari Rubenstein's gut influenced at all by his Texaco trade from the 80s? What was the extent of GTS's involvement in TRCH and or MMTLP? If Ari's gut instincts were in alignment with Dan Davio's, CEO of Canaccord Genuity, then he would have been wrong once again on an oil play. In Dan Davio's June 2021 interview with Bloomberg, when asked about the recovery of Canada's energy sector, he said the following. So you know we still don't see an immense opportunity in oil and gas. Should it happen, we're prepared to react to that. But if you're asking me over the next three to six to 12 months, do we see a huge recovery in the oil and gas sector? The answer is no. Not because demand won't be there, but because we're concerned that there's ample supply. When you look at the price history of oil from the time of that June 2021 interview, then look three months, six months and 12 months into the future, you can plainly see that Davio was incorrect in his recovery projection. This brings us to the third lesson Ari claimed to learn from his experience with Texaco. Losing money is very, very scary. You have to be prepared to make difficult decisions these are the statements of financial condition for GTS Securities for 2020, 2021 and 2022. Observe the securities sold but not yet purchased at fair value line items. Compare these lines to the respective securities owned at fair value line items. Perhaps none of these numbers represent shares of TRCH and or MMTLP having been sold. But if they did... I'd imagine that Ari would have been very scared at the prospect of having to close TRCH positions before the merger with Metamaterials. I'd imagine he'd be just as frightened, if not more, if he saw the Palikara's post on November 30th explaining that FINRA was given specific instructions. More on this in a bit, but for now. How realistic is it that Ari could have had enough pull to convince FINRA to U3 halt trading? Robert W. Cook became FINRA's CEO in 2016 his first order of business was to go on a listening tour. The purpose was to hear opinions about FINRA's strengths and weaknesses from member firms, investor groups and other regulators. Mr Cook said he intended to take a fresh look at how FINRA interacts and engages with members day to day and how FINRA promotes transparency to its members, other stakeholders and the investing public. Here's a Cook quote from the listening tour concerning two committees. Our Economic Advisory Committee includes expert economists and supports our commitment to evaluating and minimising the economic impacts of regulatory initiatives. And our market surveillance advisory group includes other academics who help FINRA evaluate and enhance its surveillance programmes. Remember, this was 2017. On June 27, 2017, Ari Rubenstein testified before the House Financial Services Committee hearing on market structure. On the subject of improving investor confidence by identifying and eliminating fraud and abuse, Rubenstein had this to say, Next, we need to do more to detect electronic trading fraud and abuse. I am a member of the FINRA Market Surveillance Advisory Group, whose goal is to assist FINRA in the construction of an advanced artificial intelligence AI and machine learning system to eradicate nefarious activity in our markets. This is a great and impressive start but more time and budget is necessary to complete these projects. By leveraging today's technology, such as AI and machine learning, 
regulators and private industry can better identify and weed out bad actors in our markets. Doing so will improve investor confidence, which is essential to widespread participation in any market. The first thing we have to point out is that while Ari Rubenstein is testifying about his efforts with FINRA to eradicate nefarious activity in the market, his own GTS Securities has already been spoofing on the New York Stock Exchange for a year and would continue to do so for the next five years. The second thing is that unless Rubenstein was already in FINRA's Market Surveillance Advisory Group, it was likely the impression that Ari made on Robert Cook during his listening tour that convinced Cook to get Rubenstein on board. This also means that Rubenstein has at the very least been an associate of Cook since Cook's first year at FINRA. This also means that since 2017, Ari would have likely had opportunities to develop relationships and or some level of camaraderie with others at FINRA. This is concerning because from the earlier examples, where we can confidently establish a connection, specifically with James Angel and Michael Pivowa, Ari appears to utilise those he employs in an attempt to further his business and protect the image of high-frequency trading. So why would his inclinations in regards to working relationships be any different? It should also be mentioned that there was another member of Rubenstein's Modern Markets Initiative in FINRA's Market Surveillance Advisory Group at the same time as Rubenstein. According to this response from FINRA, these were the members of the group from 2020 to the present, which would have been sometime in 2023. The response also notes that some of the members were in the group prior to the year 2020. Adam Nunes of HRT was in the group together with Ari for at least three years. Why did FINRA remove the evidence of Ari Rubenstein's membership from their website? And here's a 2021 article from Alexander Alsopovich about Adam Nunes that appears to reinforce his presumed alignment with high-frequency trading. Possibly unrelated on the GTS Securities Broker Check Report, only two of the 33 disclosures were initiated by FINRA, one from 2017 and one from the year 2020. The highest resulting fine was $30,000. Is this because being in the surveillance group showed Ari FINRA's blind spots? Could it be that by being hand-selected by Robert W. Cook to be in FINRA's advisory group, that GTS was given free reign? I can't say for certain that either of those options apply, but it's curious that GTS would be engaged in spoofing for so long on the New York Stock Exchange while just being a good boy scout on the OTC. I thought maybe the $10 million fine from the NYSC in some way might also encompass the spoofing lawsuits from NWBO and GTII, but there's yet to be a resolution in those cases. What evidence do those issuers have that FINRA wouldn't also possess? As early as 2013, when Brett Redfern was still with JP Morgan, he was a member of Stani, a somewhat fraternity for stock market professionals in the New York area. Cromwell Coulson, the CEO of OTC Markets, has been a member since 1998, Jeff Mendel is a member, and both GTS Securities and Canaccord Genuity have been sponsors over the years. In 2017, the SEC named Red Fern, their new Director of Division of Trading and Markets. He served in this position until the end of 2020, but not before becoming known as the father of the modern 15C to 11 amendments. The following excerpts come from the SEC's April 23rd, 2018 Roundtable on Market Structure for Thinly Traded Securities Division of Trading and Markets. The panel was moderated by Brett Redfern. In attendance was Ari Rubenstein, Michael Piwoa and Hester Pierce, among many others. As you listen, keep in mind that at this time in 2018, GTS Securities has been spoofing on the New York Stock Exchange for approximately two years, and Ari Rubenstein has been in FINRA's Market Surveillance Advisory Group for about one year. This is Ari's first time speaking during the roundtable. Director Redfern, your team commissioners, thank you for having me here today. I remember Chair Clayton's speech at the Economic Club in New York last July, and I thought he really set the bar high for technology in our industry, where he said that technology and innovation was disrupting in positive ways, and that we need to ensure that today's rules governing trading reflect the realties of our capital markets. And I think that's really relevant and germane to this roundtable, and what I want to talk about and what I live and breathe every day. My name is Ari Rubenstein. I'm the co-founder and CEO of GTS. GTS is an electronic market maker. 
We provide offers to buy and sell securities across global markets, and we do that quantitatively using computers. At the New York Stock Exchange, we're the largest designated market maker, responsible for over 900 public companies, amounting to a little over $12 trillion worth of market capitalization. And we're also directly accountable to these companies to ensure that there's liquidity available for their investors when they need it. And in the category of small cap securities under 100,000 ADV, we're at 371 companies in our portfolio that we're responsible for. I'm excited for this discussion today because I think there's a big opportunity for the industry to come together and to leverage technology to try to enhance the environment for thinly traded securities. And I look forward to sharing some of my ideas. Thanks. In this next part, Rubenstein shares a story about meeting the capital requirements for being a designated market maker and how managing a business with these obligations can be frightening. Absolutely. On that, let me share a story with regards to when GTS became a DMM. This was a few years ago. I remember we had to become compliant with a long list of rules to be a designated market maker at the New York Stock Exchange. It was different from being a market maker on any other exchange. For starters, we had to put up our share of the hundreds of millions of dollars worth of regulatory capital that we had to segregate to back up our offers to buy and sell these securities to ensure that GTS would be there, you know, during times of stress if there was a lot of volatility. Also, we had to file for each security capital commitment schedules. So over and above our quoting requirement, we had to make sure that we would supply the market with capital for each security. And this was just a couple a couple examples. So I remember being somewhat frightened managing a business that had those types of obligations. But what ended up happening was, once we got going and deployed all the technology that we built going on two decades now, we were able to hit a lot of those obligations. And I'm very proud to say that in small cap securities at the New York Stock Exchange, GTS is number one in providing price improvement compared to any other market maker down there. And that's the percentage of our quotes that are improving the national best bid offer. And we did this because we used technology. And I think that that could be an area that we can work to improve the markets. What we would recommend is a modernization of market making rules. Some of these rules were, you know, are depression era rules regarding trading and market making. They were enacted for good reason, but at a different time when, before the markets were electronic, before computers were handling trading and decision making. And so I think we can, we can modify some of these rules that will allow market makers to have more flexibility to be able to leverage the technology that they already have. And I think you could marry some of these changes with an increase of market making obligations. And I think that the scale technology market maker of today has the ability to survive with higher obligations than they have today that were built on rules enacted a long time ago. And I would take that flexibility and I would also apply it to the exchange space and allow exchanges an easier path and an easier way to innovate and come up with more solutions, especially in the area of small cap securities. Ari began by pointing out some of the GTS hardships but he then transitioned into explaining how technology has been the solution that has allowed his firm to surpass their expectations. He emphasised the advancements in the markets and the rules not keeping pace with the fact that computers were now performing the trades and making the decisions. He then set up his plea to request for more flexibility for market makers to leverage the technology and along with the changes, increase the obligations of the market makers that thanks to technology are now more capable. In the same roundtable, Redfern follows up with Ari on his suggestions for updating the market maker rules. Ari points out a time in 2015 when in a volatile morning, GTS was making markets in an ETF, but due to certain securities within the underlying baskets being restricted due to the 201 uptick rule, the computers wouldn't allow GTS to sell when they wanted to sell. And according to Ari, their inability to provide liquidity came as a cost to investors. This would only be true for day traders and or short-term investors. Requesting a bona fide market maker exemption for the uptick rule seems to mainly benefit the GTS securities business model of continuously selling securities that they don't own. Ari then goes on to say that in regards to rules for market makers borrowing securities, it should be made easier for a market maker to post two-sided quotes. Again, to add liquidity for investors. 
It seems every time a market maker proposes a change, it's for liquidity and the benefit of investors, but investors aren't the market maker's client. These suggested rule changes allow for increased opportunities to hurt the investing public, very similar to what GTS was actively engaged in doing on the New York Stock Exchange at the exact time that this roundtable was in session. I'd rather not go into the fact that Virtue, Citadel and GTS comment letters were considered when Rule 15 C211 was amended. I'd rather not go into the concessions that were made that seemed to perfectly align with allowing creative ways to get securities listed. I also don't want to talk about a certain division of trading and markets meeting that occurred long after Brett Redfern was no longer with the SEC. My goal here is to aid the FSIO in their MMTLP investigation of FINRA. One way of doing so is to point out that in the period from 2018 to 2020, where Rubenstein would have likely been developing relationships within FINRA, a report from the Governmental Accountability Office made the following findings. SEC has several opportunities to leverage information obtained from its reviews of FINRA to inform its FINRA oversight goals. Currently, SEC's performance measures, see table, for FINRA oversight are task-oriented, such as conducting meetings, and do not reflect leading practices, such as being outcome-oriented and providing useful information for decision-making. SEC's programme for overseeing FINRA also does not have documented policies and procedures for determining which findings and any associated corrective actions to track, or for identifying and communicating the significance of findings from its oversight of FINRA to internal stakeholders and to FINRA. By establishing such measures, policies and procedures, SEC would gain information that would allow it to better monitor and assess the impact of its reviews of FINRA, better evaluate FINRA responses and more clearly communicate concerns to FINRA. Gao made these suggestions for the SE's FSIO. SEC's performance measures for its FINRA and Securities Industry Oversight FSIO program. Create annual inspection and examination oversight plan. Monitor progress and complete inspection and examination plan. Process tips, complaints and referrals. Conduct periodic meetings with FINRA. Document examination plan update meetings. Review recurring information from FINRA. Conduct internal meetings with FSIO staff and provide training. Meet with other SEC departments periodically to identify risks and priorities. Inform Division of Examinations Leadership Weekly about oversight of FINRA. Conduct meetings of FSIO senior staff to discuss FSIO risk mitigation efforts. In 2008, Charles Gasparino wrote an article in the Daily Beast titled How the SEC Got in Bed with the Madoffs Literally. The article points out that the Madoff case was clearly a Ponzi scheme, and while Madoff was deserving of the blame, the article draws a fair amount of attention to the fact that the regulators also dropped the ball. Interestingly, direct parallels can be drawn to how FINRA has mishandled the MMTLP case. There was at least one letter sent to the SEC informing them that Madoff was running a Ponzi scheme. There have been thousands of letters about MMTLP after the halt, but before the halt, there was at least one letter that explained the manipulation that had occurred. The article points out conflicts of interest and funny business with the Madoff auditor. One of the market makers suspected of making MMTLP tradable had seemingly been in FINRA's market surveillance advisory group for at least five years at the time that MMTLP was U3 halted. This same market maker, GTS Securities, has had the same auditor, Crow LLP, since 2015. The Public Accounting Oversight Board recommends rotating audit partners every five years to enhance objectivity. GTS Securities has continued to use Crow LLP for at least eight years. The article refers to a revolving door which describes how SEC employees wind up working for law firms that have big contracts with Wall Street firms. The same is true for FINRA. There were at least three departures from FINRA enforcement since the U3 halt and they each landed at firms on the other side of regulation. Gasparino goes on to say that the conflicts of interest in cases like these aren't the type where money changes hands and regulators look the other way. In a direct quote, conflicts of interest are more often much more subtle. In bureaucratic institutions like the SEC, they stifle scepticism and impose groupthink of the sort that people you're regulating or investigating couldn't have done anything wrong because, well, you know them so well. Ari Rubenstein appears to have been added to FINRA's Market Surveillance Advisory Group by Robert W. Cook himself. 
Ari Rubinstein appears to have said all of the right things before the HFSC on market structure, and less than a year later, he looks to have appealed to the sensibilities of Brett Redfern of the SEC. I doubt you need a reminder, but all of this took place while Rubenstein's GTS securities firm was spoofing on the New York Stock Exchange as one of the largest designated market makers in existence. The Gasparino article doesn't say much about Robert Colby, other than that he was in market regulation at the SEC during the time of the Madoff investigation, but Colby is very involved in the MMTLP case. Colby now serves as FINRA's lead counsel, and from correspondences released by FINRA in July of 2023, we know that Colby was in communication with Clifton Dubose Jr., then CEO of Nextbridge Hydrocarbons, from mid-April 2023 to June 2023. In the April 18th letter from Dubose, he incorrectly refers to FINRA Rule 6490, but I'm not entirely sure it was done by mistake. The result of this was a response from Robert Colby, where he correctly describes FINRA's process for reviewing corporate actions according to Rule 6490. FINRA's role in the process is thus limited to reviewing and processing the submission and announcing the corporate action to market participants, unless the corporate action documentation is found to be deficient under the rule, in which case FINRA may determine not to process the corporate action. Understandably, Colby leaves out the criteria according to Rule 6490 by which FINRA reviews a corporate action before processing the submission. As mentioned very early in this video, ensuring that the corporate action allows for settlement and clearance is part of that Rule 6490 review. How is it that FINRA waited to make a deficiency determination related to settlement and clearance after twice posting the MMTLP corporate action to their daily list. Colby correctly refers to the shares of MMTLP being cancelled by the issuer on December 14, 2022, but nowhere in the letter does he explain why neither MMTLP corporate actions included the correct December 14 share cancellation date. This contradicts the role of FINRA according to Rule 6490, because in changing the share cancellation date to one day earlier on the initial corporate action, this created an obvious settlement issue since the corporate action also indicated that purchases could take place after December 8th. If FINRA just kept the December 14th date from Meta Materials, then there wouldn't have been an issue. FINRA knows this. When FINRA revised the MMTLP corporate action on December 8th, they did so in a way that still allowed for them to be unclear about the correct share cancellation, pay slash distribution and effective date of the exchange. This completely ignored SEA Rule 10 B17 and FINRA's Rule 6490. The two corporate actions are very much crime scenes frozen in time. FINRA claims they were created consistent with the submission from the issuer and the November 23rd Meta Materials PR. If this is true, why don't the dates match? Who at FINRA insisted on making December 13th the most important date on both MMTLP corporate actions? That person or group of people is directly responsible for the extraordinary event. Robert Colby and Ari Rubenstein were both panellists at the same Rosenblatt Securities Conference in October 2017. They weren't on the same panel, but at this time Ari was already in FINRA's market surveillance group and he had already testified before the HFSC. They likely attended more of the same events since then, and I only bring it up to show that it's potentially another opportunity where paths could have crossed, and where relationships could have developed to eventually lead to the subtle conflicts of interest described by Gasparino that stifle scepticism. Here are some similarities between Bernie Madoff's operation and GTS Securities. Madoff's broker-dealer never carried customer accounts, it acted as a wholesale market-making firm executing order flow for other broker-dealers, and trading in their own accounts. This allowed Madoff to escape the scrutiny of FINRA since they were seen as a counterparty rather than a firm that managed customer accounts. GTS is a wholesale market maker. They do not carry customer accounts. Madoff was an architect of the electronic NASDAQ market and he sat on the board of governors of the NASD, which was the predecessor to FINRA. Madoff's knowledge of the markets and the way that regulators operated might have helped him to design his scheme to avoid detection. Ari Rubenstein and his GTS firm were early adopters 
and contributors to the advancement of algorithmic trading. As a member of FINRA's Market Surveillance Advisory Group, his goal was to assist FINRA in creating an advanced AI machine learning system to eliminate nefarious activity in the stock market. Madoff operated his Ponzi scheme from the 17th floor of the Lipstick Building in Manhattan, where he also hid his fraudulent records. The main offices of the Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities were on the 18th and 19th floors. GTS Securities occupies 30,094 square feet of space in their 545 Madison, New York location. GTS utilizes the 9th, 15th, 16th, and 17th floors of the building. Ari Rubenstein takes it to different levels. GTS General Counsel Richard Grant has at least eight years of experience with the SEC, including as legal counsel under two SEC commissioners, one of which was Michael Piwawa, Small World, and as staff in the Office of Derivatives Policy Division of Trading and Markets. Rama Subramaniam is head of Systematic Asset Management at GTS New York. He is also on the SEC Asset Management Advisory Committee. Ryan Scheftel left GTS Securities without even a farewell LinkedIn post. He was partner at GTS for over eight years. Two of his duties included automated market making and high frequency trading. He also brought with him four years of experience at Citadel Securities and five years of experience from Goldman Sachs. Listing all of the interesting connections could be lengthy, so I'll just end with this one that leads to some other information. GTS Securities has strategically collaborated with BNP Paribas since November 2017, providing improved pricing in the secondary market for US Treasuries. Here's Ari Rubenstein in London a year later, where GTS and BNP signed a new memorandum of understanding, allowing BNP to expand into US equities. The article states that BNP Paribas continues to be committed to growing its presence in the US market and providing its clients with enhanced and innovative liquidity solutions. Then near the end of 2023, FINRA announced that Feral Talib, formerly of BNP Paribas, was named to a new role at FINRA, Executive Vice President and Head of Surveillance and Market Intelligence. In the new role, Talib will be leading FINRA's surveillance programme. So Talib was with BNP Paribas for eight years, which includes all of the time they were in partnership with Ari Rubinstein. Then, Talib joins FINRA in a new role directly related to the market surveillance group where Rubinstein was once a member, and for all we know, could still be a member. And even if Ari isn't in the group, his fellow Modern Markets Initiative buddy, Adam Nunes, might be. Could just be a coincidence, though. If that wasn't enough, BNP Paribas has recently been embroiled in a naked short-selling crackdown from South Korea that has recently resulted in their offices being raided. It could be that this activity occurred outside of Feral Talib's purview, but the overall optics just give off a questionable appearance. It also doesn't help that Talib spent seven years at Goldman Sachs in market surveillance, and they too have a storied history of naked short selling, including in South Korea, evidence or coincidence. And this brings us to the fact that Goldman Sachs, along with SG America, serve as clearing brokers for GTS securities. Clearing brokers have the ability to recognize share imbalances in real time, so Goldman Sachs would likely know if GTS still held short positions in MMTLP, if there was a situation where blue sheet requests went out to GTS Securities, the process would involve Goldman Sachs and SG America if they were the clearing broker for the security. It's concerning to know that they both have a history of deficient blue sheet submissions. But in my opinion, if my desire were to engage in questionable activities, the wisest move would be to align with those that have continually gotten away with those same questionable activities. And since there's at least one person from Goldman Sachs on FINRA's Board of Governors, that person would likely have some say in whether a security should be U3 halted. But that's just one person. There are so many others with ties to Goldman Sachs. If the FSIO or another investigative agency really wanted to know what went wrong with MMTLP, a good place to start is this message from TD Ameritrade. They make it clear that GTS Securities and Canaccord Genuity were involved in the earliest trades. The main reason, in my opinion, and the opinion of many others, that a market maker would need MMTLP to trade is that they were still short TRCH going into the June 2021 reverse merger with Metamaterials. Similar to what FINRA attempted to do, short positions from TRCH 
were able to transfer to MMAT and the OCC created a pathway via options by which the Series A preferred share placeholder could eventually become tradable as MMTLP. If a regulatory body like FINRA and or the SEC truly cared about protecting investors and market integrity, they would have used the resources available to them to just check which market participants failed to close out their obligations from shorting TRCH and then checking to see if any similar behaviours carried into the trading of MMTLP. With the information that we do have available, we can observe that from 2019 to 2020, there was a drastic increase in GTS securities liabilities, particularly in the securities sold but not yet purchased line item. I don't make the assumption that the increase is entirely attributed to shorting TRCH, but I've already established why it's logical to suspect that GTS held liabilities. Next, when you factor in that Torchlight had issues with manipulative short selling for many years, and then combine that with the impact the pandemic had on oil prices, Torchlight likely appeared to be an easy target for short sellers to abusively short the company into bankruptcy. In addition, since Ari Rubenstein was in FINRA's Market Surveillance Advisory Group, even if his input was limited, he'd be fully aware of the fact that FINRA announced the retirement of Cameron Funkhauser in a late August 2019 press release. Cameron Funkhauser spent 35 years at FINRA, where he led their Office of Fraud Detection and Market Intelligence, which included the Insider Trading and Fraud Surveillance Units, FINRA's Complaint Centre and FINRA's Whistleblower Programme. According to the press release, Funkhauser was highly regarded throughout the industry for his expertise in conducting investigations and leadership in developing FINRA's regulatory programmes for insider trading and other types of fraud. The press release indicated that he retired at the end of 2019. As far as I can tell, there was no one person that could have filled the gap left by Funkhauser. This is evidenced by FINRA recognising the need to hire Feral Talib at the end of 2023 for the newly created role, Executive Vice President and Head of Surveillance and Market Intelligence. The description, leading FINRA's surveillance programme, so again, with Funkhauser's exit at the end of 2019 and fewer workers going into the office beginning in 2020, a person like Ari Rubenstein that was in FINRA's Market Surveillance Advisory Group might have recognised an opportunity to get away with things that wouldn't have been possible a year earlier. 753,251,473 in liabilities in 2019 to 7,380,192,667 in liabilities in 2020. That's a difference of nearly 10x. If Ari was frightened when he needed to put up millions of dollars when becoming a designated market maker on the New York Stock Exchange, being liable for more than $7 billion worth of securities sold but not yet purchased, had to be absolutely terrifying. In a seven-page comment letter from Ari Rubenstein to Vanessa Countryman, dated February 26, 2020, were offered a glimpse into just how terrified Rubenstein was. The comment letter is a response to the SEC's proposed changes to Rule 15C211, changes that, according to Rubenstein, were overly broad and sweeping in nature and will undoubtedly have unintended consequences which will have a negative impact on the marketplace and will not optimise the deterrence of fraudulent activity. The proposed changes would have made it more difficult to list securities, which sounds as though it would have helped to prevent securities that were never meant to trade from trading. Strange that Rubenstein would see these changes as problematic. In the comment letter, Rubenstein expresses that Rule 15C211 is a burden for market makers and that piggyback exemptions should be expanded to a laundry list of derivative securities that included preferred shares. Is it a coincidence that the Series A preferred share from Metamaterials became tradable in the following year and that GTS Securities appears to have been involved? The part of the comment letter that makes it seem that Rubenstein is in over his head is found on the last page right before the conclusion. On the topic of regulation show, Rubenstein included the following. As a registered market maker in thousands of stocks, we stand ready to provide continuous liquidity to broker-dealer clients and non-client contraparties. Our trading counterparties value and depend on our liquidity provisioning. In less liquid securities, however, our ability to meet liquidity demands when acting as a bona fide market maker are made significantly more difficult 
by the closeout requirements of Rule 204 of Regulation Show. The financial exposure posed by the existing T plus 5 closeout period is an impediment to efficient price discovery and continuous liquidity, as supported by the academic paper Squeezing the Shorts in Small Cap Stocks by Roberto Rico, Regulation Show, as currently constituted, may in fact be more of a catalyst for manipulation of securities than the piggyback exemption is. In case you didn't catch it, according to Ari Rubinstein, giving market makers the ability to easily list whatever securities they want is a good thing, but requiring market makers to close out within T plus 5 is bad. Regulation Show was last amended 10 years prior to this comment letter. It was just two years prior that Rubenstein touted the proficiencies of algorithmic trading. So why would a computer now be encountering problems with rules that have long been in place? If the rules were followed correctly and properly enforced, they would have prevented the situation that Rubenstein found himself in. The coding issue that FINRA would blame to explain why MMTLP FTDs were being tracked according to the wrong standard still never justified why the FTDs weren't addressed before the coding issue was discovered. From the year 2020, we can gain significant insight into how Ari Rubenstein leverages his relationships with FINRA and James Angel in a way that coincidentally appears similar to what would soon occur with MMTLP. Overstock was another security that dealt with abusive short selling and when they decided to offer a dividend exclusively on their own T0 platform, it created a problem for anyone that might have heavily shorted OSTK. Ari Rubenstein's GTS Securities managed to trade the dividend on the OTC, which was against the wishes of Overstock. Ari was quoted in this May 2020 article from Bloomberg, This is flatly against everything we believe in. America's market system is not based on dictating the trading venue, and charging exorbitant fees. GTS and the other market makers that traded the Overstock dividend on the OTC were contacted by Overstock's lawyers on May 7th. By May 15th, GTS was given permission from FINRA to continue trading the dividend. How about that? According to the same article, Georgetown University professor James Angel had this to say, this raises fundamental questions about the rights of shareholders. The article goes on to say that Angel also was an Overstock shareholder that closely followed the company. How about that? This is Kirsten Wegner of Modern Markets Initiative. Beginning in May of 2016, she credits herself as building the DC office MMI from the ground up. A little more than a year later, she became Chief Executive Officer of Modern Markets Initiative, a role she's been in for more than six and a half years. Kirsten is a lawyer, policy expert and a fintech writer. She has testified before Congress and speaks at universities and conferences to promote and educate the public concerning high-frequency trading technology and advocacy. There's nothing wrong with advocating for what you believe in, but I've noticed some apparent contradictions and biases in my opinion after only viewing two videos on YouTube in which she is featured. The first one is from July 2019, titled HFT Against Bad Actors. Kirsten Wegner, CEO of MMI on TD Ameritrade Real Talk Show. In the video, she points out their role of making sure people understand the benefits of high-frequency trading and that their members, which include GTS Securities, work with regulators, including FINRA, to deploy their technological capacity to thwart bad actors. She says it's important that they're doing this because there are people that are spoofing and engaging in other illegal activities in an effort to take advantage of new technologies. She says that MMI members share their tools to catch other firms and then turn them into FINRA so that they weed out the bad actors that give the industry a bad name. How could GTS be helping regulators catch firms that are spoofing when they've been engaged in the practice from 2016 to 2022? Remember, this video is from 2019. If GTS and the other members of MMI are capable of detecting manipulation in other firms, how can they expect anyone to believe they were unaware of the manipulation taking place in their own operations? Has Kirsten made a public statement concerning the spoofing and the other illegal activities undertaken by GTS that has resulted in them paying $10 million in fines? Do the members of MMI check up on the other members to see if they are breaking any rules? Could it be that in entrusting MMI members to aid FINRA in detecting activities such as spoofing, that FINRA allocated their own resources to other areas? The next video is from April 19th, 2020, 
and it features Kirsten Wegner having a discussion with Georgetown professor Jim Angel. Just my opinion, but I think it's intentional that when Angel is associated with MMI, he goes by Jim, but when Angel is involved in activities outside of MMI, he's mostly known as James. The video is titled MMI Brown Bag Lunch Virtual Series featuring Professor Jim Angel, Georgetown University. There are a number of interesting things said in the video, but I'll only point out two that stand out. First, according to Angel, one of the problems with trading halts is that they lock people into positions when they might need access to their cash in order to survive. He appears to be speaking about the major exchanges and the larger context was the uncertainty surrounding the pandemic. But I think it's all encompassing when he says that imposing a halt should be a last resort and Kirsten Wegner appeared to agree. FINRA didn't halt MMTLP because of an extraordinary event that caught them off guard like the pandemic. The SEC and FINRA were aware of issues relating to MMTLP shortly after it became tradable in late 2021. Both entities were aware of fraud tips and complaints before the corporate actions were created. Sam Draddy of FINRA was alerted to potential fraud related to the issues of MMTLP on December 5, 2022. And after beginning the blue sheet process and attempting to coordinate investigations with the SEC, FINRA posted the first MMTLP corporate action the very next day. Are we supposed to believe that FINRA suspected fraud, investigated and closed the case in 24 hours? If so, why does FINRA give the impression the blue sheet process is tedious and complicated? The suspicion of fraud on December 5th was also another reason, according to FINRA Rule 6490, not to have proceeded with the MMTLP corporate action. I mean, if investor protection and market integrity were truly important to FINRA, the best move would have been to hold off on the corporate action, halt trading, communicate with the issuer and the public, complete the investigation and then move forward with the corporate action. Instead, we're supposed to believe that with all of this attention at FINRA and the SEC about a single OTC security, the December 14th MMTLP share cancellation date being moved one day earlier to December 13th, was something that wasn't caught during FINRA's Rule 6490 review process. This one act, combined with the lack of clarity in the wording of both corporate actions, are the basis for the settlement issue that FINRA uses as their reason for the U3 halt. So FINRA revised the MMTLP corporate action to include a December 13th symbol deletion date, except FINRA doesn't include pertinent information such as the cancellation date, pay slash distribution date, the correct effective date, nor do they include the words record date. FINRA had a second chance to get it right, but they still failed. It's almost like they needed a reason to U3 halt trading. FINRA's U3 halt of MMTLP was and is unprecedented because it has prematurely removed the market for trading in entirety and therefore has separated investors from their cash for nearly 15 months and counting. Regardless of whether it was responsible to do so, this is money that people needed for their families, their retirement, their healthcare needs and living expenses. Investors that held MMTLP beyond December 8th, 2022 were deceived by FINRA. These are just some of the messages from brokerages that were sent to their clients, instructing them as to what they should expect concerning the trading of MMTLP after December 8th, 2022. We also can't leave out that the VP of OTC markets where MMTLP traded, Jeff Mendel shared to hundreds of thousands of viewers that MMTLP would trade up until December 12th, 2022. So if your brokerage told you something and the information appeared to align with information directly from the VP of the market where your security traded, it was actually reasonable to believe that you had until December 12th to decide if you wanted to sell or to hold your shares of MMTLP. The second thing comes toward the end of the video when there's a question concerning the difference between automated trading and high frequency trading. Kirsten notes that all members of Modern Markets Initiative are automated traders and high frequency traders that see the positives in the industry for the market and for retail investors. She's transparent in what MMI and their members represent. On the other hand, Jim Angel isn't presented as a paid advisor of MMI. He's only recognized as a professor from Georgetown University. 
The question didn't appear to catch him off guard because he quickly transitioned to a slide in his presentation that correlated to his response. He went on to explain that he's a collector of stocks and that high-frequency traders help retail investors because they lower the bid-ask spread, they incorporate news into market prices and allow for zero commissions, which benefits the whole market, according to Angel. He also makes a derogatory statement about busted preferred shares on the pink sheets when he says their bid R spreads don't benefit as much as their major exchange counterparts. This insight into how Angel views preferred shares on the OTC is eye-opening because more than a year before the series A preferred share from Meta Materials began trading on the OTC, Angel makes it known that he isn't particularly fond. This means that when he began to share his displeasure with the issuers after the U3 halt, he was doing so as someone that was connected to Ari Rubenstein via Modern Markets Initiative, someone that had a low view of preferred shares trading on the OTC, and a Georgetown University professor with direct ties to FINRA. Jim or James Angel should be considered the ultimate conflict of interest when it comes to anything regarding MMTLP. By the way, here's proof that Jimmy Jam has been an MMI advisory board member since at least September 16th, 2019. This means all of his comments related to Overstock and MMTLP occurred while he was being paid by Ari Rubenstein's Modern Markets Initiative. Is the true reason that Georgetown professor James Angel allegedly buys every stock in the stock market so that he can offer his opinion from the perspective of a shareholder and an expert? How damning is it that Angel presented this slideshow to Congress and is quoted in articles under the guise of representing Georgetown University? But in reality, the arguments he makes appear to best serve Ari Rubenstein, the founder of GTS Securities and Modern Markets Initiative, where James Angel is employed as an advisor. If this relationship wasn't an issue, why is it that the Modern Markets Initiative website removed all traces of James Angel? This is a screenshot of Angel's profile, as it once appeared on the Modern Markets Initiative website. These are remnants of links to his profile on Google, but when you click them now, you get a 404 code, indicating the page was moved or deleted. I searched the site thoroughly. It was deleted. On the Milken website, they've also made changes. For some reason, you can no longer see pictures of Charles Gasparino or Ari Rubenstein. These pages still load with their names and profiles, but the images do not load. Toward the end of June 2021, the reverse merger between Torchlight Energy Resources and Meta Materials was completed. There was a run-up in the price of TRCH that I would attribute to a variety of factors, some short positions closing, some buying to eventually receive the preferred share dividend, and a lot of holding shares of TRCH for that same reason. If GTS Securities had exposure to short positions in TRCH, and if they closed those positions in 2021, then their statement of financial condition might have reflected a decrease in securities sold, but not yet purchased. Instead, what we see is yet another increase by nearly $3 billion worth of liabilities. Again, we don't have the necessary resources to see why the liabilities of GTS Securities increased, but these financial statements appear to correlate with not closing short positions in 2021. If GTS participated in getting MMTLP tradable in 2021 and potentially continued to short, that was an additional nearly three months of shorting activity, followed by nearly the entire 2022 to either close short positions or to continue shorting. This is the GTS Securities Statement of Financial Condition for the year 2022. It reflects a nearly $5 billion decrease in securities sold, but not yet purchased. If GTS held obligations to close short positions related to TRCH and or MMTLP in 2022, this reduction in liabilities gives the appearance that a great deal of those positions were potentially closed. Or could it be that since FINRA U3 halted trading in MMTLP and attempted to allow all short positions to transfer to next bridge hydrocarbons, could it be that the current $0 value attributed to the next bridge shares just gives the appearance that GTS cleared those liabilities? And where's Ari? 